welcome to the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast, your guide to help you manage life, money, and multiples. Each episode, host Paul Fenner, Tama Capital's president and founder, and the proud parent of four amazing children, including one set of triplets, will provide insights on successfully sustaining an active lifestyle, career, and family through comprehensive wealth management strategies, financial education, and lifestyle planning, specific to parents raising twins, triplets, and more. Learn more, subscribe to the show, or connect with Paul at TamaCapital.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for investment decisions. Clients of Tama may retain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. How do you help your kids determine what they want to be when they grow up? Furthermore, how do you balance the emotional and financial sides of going through the college planning process to help them find their way? These are questions that almost every parent and family wrestle with when it comes to raising kids. Fortunately, there are professionals to help parents along this journey, like Holly Bennett, a high school guidance counselor and licensed counselor with multiple master's degrees. One of the hidden secrets of any planning, be it financial or personal, is the pressure it can take off of you, and planning for your kids' college is no different. Like wealth planning, the best time to have conversations regarding college planning is early and often. Holly points out many times throughout our discussion that these conversations help us determine what makes sense for our kids academically and socially when it comes to selecting the best fit for college. But critically important, according to Holly, is to break these conversations into bite-sized pieces that your kids can comprehend. Please enjoy my conversation with Holly Bennett. So Holly Bennett, welcome to the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. Thanks, Paul. I'm really excited to be here with you today. I um, Before we hit record, I, had, I we were talking about how excited I've been to have this conversation because you came through me from Kurt and Peggy Brissett, who are great friends, neighbors, and family office clients of mine. You work with their daughter, Megan, at, at Mercy here in, mm-hmm. in Metro Detroit, and uh, Peggy couldn't talk uh, highly enough about you. So um, I've been looking for this for a while. So I'm glad uh, glad we finally made the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love working with high school students and I always love to find those connections with people between, you know, how, how everybody gets connected because we're all connected in one way or another. That's right. And we think that those connections are long. You hear about the, the Kevin Bacon, six degrees of separation. And, and I think we're down to like two or three these days, it seems like. Absolutely. Absolutely. So- why don't we start with your background? Tell us who you are, what you do, and I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile. And when people go there, they'll see your name and they'll see a lot of letters after your name. So walk us through what <laughs> all these things, all those designations mean. Because yes. I have the same, same problem or same benefit, I guess, in, in my industry as well. So absolutely you take it away. Um, thank you so much. So I've been working with high school students for over 20 years. And it's my favorite population to work with. Um, and what got me here is um, just finding ways to expand what I do. So I started after college working at the university level in housing and residence life. And I realized I wanted to work with younger students. But what my degrees were in, so my first master's degree is actually in higher ed administration. That wasn't getting me to work with high school students, <laughs> right? Like, I, I was working, I was, I was going to school to work at a university. Um, so I eventually went back to school and got a master's degree in school counseling. So that's one of my master's degrees. And then I'm also a um, licensed professional counselor here in the state of Michigan. And I'm a nationally certified counselor. Um, so I can do some emotional counseling as well, but I choose to keep my practice and the work I do outside of Mercy High School on the college planning aspect. And then that Mercy, I love to walk with my students on their high school journey because high school is such an exciting time. It really is. There's highs and lows, but there's just such cool things that happen in high school. Yeah, there's a, I, I'm, I'm getting closer to those roller coaster years, but I feel like I've lived, that's the great thing about what I do and the, the tremendous families that I've worked with over the last you know, 20 plus years, uh, what I do is seeing the growth of, of those, of those kids really, and how I become so attached to them and seeing them go through grade school, middle school, high school, and then through college and then starting their own, um, careers and adventures. So it's, um, 
it's definitely one of the, the highlights of what I do. And I'm sure it's one of the highlights right. of, of what you do as well. And one of the things I love about the, the college process and on that journey is this is for some students, the first big decision they're making, right? It's the first time they really have to step back and think about who am I, who do I want to be, and where does that take me? And like most things, it is one of the, the, the biggest emotional decisions that they're going to make. And that's what I always talk about with, with parents when it comes to college planning, there's and a very emotional component and a very financial component. And sometimes we get those wires crossed where the emotional side takes over more so than the financial side. And sometimes vice versa, the financial um, side of it gets more attention than the emotional side, which I think there's a, a balance there. And I think we'll, we'll end up getting on the striking that, that, that balance or topic uh, throughout our conversation. Absolutely. So why don't we start, why don't we kind of start there with one of my first questions I had for you are, are, was what are parents missing in helping their kids prepare, search for, and apply for college? So if you take them in those three buckets, why don't we dive in, in, in right there? Absolutely. I think one of the things you mentioned about the emotional aspect is really key. This is a process that is really turned into fear-based, right? And when you talk to students, they're talking about, I'm afraid I'm not going to get anywhere, anywhere. Parents are into the fear as well. We see, you know, Facebook posts, because as parents, we're usually on Facebook. Um, students are on Instagram and, and you see where people are going and you're wondering if you're going to measure up. And so one of the things that we miss is when we focus on that fear, or what would happen or what could happen next, we're missing part of the joy of the journey. And I know that sounds kind of cheesy and cliche, but to sit down and really start to have good conversations with your student or your son or daughter about what, what they're looking for, where do they find joy? What do they like and what they don't like? We also forget high school is a great prep to prepare for the college. Everything that's being done in high school is to get you ready for the next step. But if we get so focused on the fear, we miss those important steps. So I think that's one of the key things is like really step away from that and, and try to enjoy the process with your students. That's got to be extremely overwhelming because of the, the amount of pressure. Um, and I'm just, and I know you have a front row seat to this from that aspect. And I do as well from the financial side, right. but there's so much pressure and how, how do you help? parents, families, both parents and students alleviate some of that pressure. Right. I think some of it is just talking the sheer numbers, right? What we, a lot of what we hear about, there's not real stats to back up. And when I say we hear about, these are in conversations. We're on the golf course. We're at the swim club. We're grocery shopping. We're at a parent meet function, whatever it might be. More than half the colleges in our country accept more than half of their applicants. So we hear most about in the news, these highly selective schools or highly rejective, right? Where they're taking less than 10% of the students that apply. Um, most schools are taking well more than 50% of their applicants. And so we start to look at what makes sense for your student. Like let's step away from those numbers. Um, you could solve world peace and still not get into one of those highly rejective schools. But there are other schools out there that are going to give you a similar experience and you're going to feel just at home with. So it's really focusing on the individual student and where they're at and not also getting caught up in what other people are doing. I have an outside small private practice um, and with my high school students and with my private practice students, students can sometimes be doing different things at the same time. So I might have a student working on their application, but I have another student working on their essay because the journey is different for everybody. In the end, we all get to the same result, completed applications. Well, I, um, I have my own personal story is I, it goes back to those highly selective schools. So mm -hmm. I had planned on going to Notre Dame since I was, I don't know, nine or 10 years old, maybe even earlier than that. And I did a horrific job of planning for college because you know what I did? I just planned. That's where I was going. Come mm -hmm. hell or high water hell or high water. And then I didn't get in. And this was in 19, I graduated high school in 1994. And 
I didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. My backup plan was actually to go to um, IU down in Bloomington until I realized, oh, crap, um, there's no financial aid for really out of state um, students. Oh, and by the way, the cost to go to IU out of state was just as much to go as to go to Notre Dame at the time. And, you know, I think I, I look at back at that situation and think, well, how, how did I get missed? Like I was a really good student. I seemed like I was on top of things, but somehow I slipped through the cracks where no one was helping me. And do you, do you see that often or, and how, how do you let, how do you not let kids slip through the cracks? Right. right. So I think it's having those conversations early and often, right. It's, it's never too early to start talking about college, but we have to frame how we're talking about. It. I'm not going to ask my seventh graders, what college do you want to go to? Or my ninth graders, if when they're ninth grade, like I, those are not questions I ask, but what is it you like about school? What don't you like about school? When we go on family vacations, if there's a college nearby, we walk the campus. So That's my kids, awesome. right, because they need to see what's out there. Sometimes we'll do an official tour and they roll their eyes because it's really for me at that point when they were younger. But we always walk college campuses just so they can get a feel of what this looks like and what this feels like. And even if you don't go on family vacations, look around your area. There's plenty of college campuses that you can just walk. Go have a picnic on a college campus, like just those kind of things to just start that exposure. Um And try to step away from that one dream school. There are multiple schools that students will match with. There are over 2,500 four-year colleges in the United States. That's a lot of places to match 100%. And I know I usually share with my students when they're struggling, um, as I tour campuses, and before COVID, I would go to nine to 10 college campuses a year on average. Um, There would be campuses I would walk on and I'd be like, oh my gosh, had I known this was here, I might have applied here. Of course I didn't. That was, you know, a long, long time ago. That was (laughs) over 30 years ago. Um, but, But it's those kind of things that... So stepping away from that one dream school, there's multiple right fits. And when we help students build a college list, it's really about where do you want to go? I want a student to have a list and the average student applies to six to eight schools. Um, I want all of those schools to be first choice schools. Now, some you're going to be more excited about, like in your case, if you had IU and Notre Dame on your list, you liked them both equally as well. You're going to be a little more excited about going to Notre Dame and getting that acceptance than maybe IU, but you're still just as happy with that IU. So really, I hate that. I don't like the term safety school. A lot of times we hear, well, that's my safety school. Safety, yeah. safety implies less than. Right. right? It's not. It's, it's just, not. It's what's the best fit. Right. So we really focus on that. And again, of course, some are going to be more excited about, but that doesn't make them less, you know, less valid or less worthy if you're not quite as excited, as long as you like it and you can see yourself there. So going, going back, because I get this question all the time is when should I start having the conversation about college or really it can be next steps after, after high school. I, Cause I know we're going to talk primarily about college, but I will also say college is not for everybody either. Correct. Um, so there's, there's other, other avenues to go on and, and maybe that's a whole nother episode that I bring you back and we talk about uh, that. But when the, the, the question going back to when should I start having that conversation with my kids and how do I start having it? And I'm assuming that there's different stages that the, the questions you're And that's kind of a two for one question here. When should I start having that? And what questions should I be having? And what, how should those questions be framed at each age or stage of the game, whether it's middle school, early high school, mid high school, late high school? I think one in the early ages, so that seventh and eighth grade um, timeframe is just really like, if there's something your, your student enjoys doing, wow, like, did you know there's careers that can go with that? And then how do you get there? Well, this is the pathway to that. And sometimes it is college. Sometimes it's an associate degree. Sometimes it's a certification, right? So how, so, so really taking what they like to do and what that can look like at the next step. Um, just having those early conversations. Um, you know, if, if you happen to watch athletic college athletic events with your student, 
um, on a weekend. Talk about what that's like outside of that, right? So you're watching the big Michigan game um, on, on a weekend or a Michigan State game. Got to give equal props to both of them. Yes, right? So Michigan yep. or a Michigan State game. Um, and, you know, do you know what happens when these students aren't on the field? Do you know what they're doing? This is what this is what their goal is after. So really paint the picture of how encompassing this is. And then it, probably the biggest way you don't want to introduce it, and it happens all the time, and I have to bite my tongue as a parent as well, is when a student is struggling academically, you don't say that you'll never get into college, mm. right? So because yes. now I'm not good enough. Um, also, you know, this if, if you keep doing this, you're not going to be ready for college. High school's hard. And the reality is I'm not sending my sophomore to college next year. There's like two years before a sophomore has to go. And I use my, I don't have a sophomore, but all my kids are mine. Right. <laughs> um, so sending, sending them to, I'm not, there's things that happen and it's a scary thought when you think about going off to college, even if you're living at home and going to college, there's a lot you have to manage on your own. And so that just adds to the fear. Um, so it's talking about the activities, right? So as a ninth grader, we should be talking about what do you want to get involved in? What are the activities you like? Is there something you want to let go of? It's okay to say goodbye to something you've done just because you have um, played soccer, you're, you know, up until high school, it's okay if you're not finding joy in it to let it go. What are we going to explore instead of that? What classes do you like? Teaching students how to advocate for themselves. So if a student is struggling in class, helping them draft that email to a teacher. And these all are ways to actually not only prepare for college, but when students talk about, I'm really afraid to go to college, how am I going to manage? Then you have things, you have things in your tool belt that you can say, oh my gosh, remember when you had to do this with Miss X? That's exactly what you're going to do in college. And you were doing that in ninth and 10th grade. Yeah, I, I have to constantly remind myself, and Teresa and I do this to each other all the time, that you know, our triplets are going to be 12 in December or plus one's going to be 10 in October is we're still dealing with these, these individuals that do not have fully formed brains. Correct. It, it, that, Correct. that will go all the way up to college and, and, it and sure high school does. and beyond. It sure does. And that's one of the things I think that's when we break the whole, the whole college of discussions need to be broken down into small, immediate things. Because our teens don't have the ability to process information that eight, that's 18 months now. So as I start to work with my seniors, so all these students are going to come back to me in the fall, and I'm asking them to make decisions for something that they're not even going to attend from a year from now. So you have to break everything into very small chunks, and this is why we're doing this. I think also instead of framing like the question, what do you want to do when you grow up? So let's talk about career because that's scary for students as well. When you start to like focus, like, I, I don't know what I want to do. What's out there? Like you're a financial planner, mom, you're a counselor. Maybe I'll do that, whatever it might be. Um, focus on the classes they like and how that could lead to something. Um, career, there are new careers right now developing every 18 months not jobs, actual careers. So by the time our students, my, my, I have a senior right now, by the time she graduates next year, there will be a whole new set of careers that have unfolded that don't even exist. So really, what do you like to do and how can we teach those skills? There are some great career surveys out there online through ONET if students want to take those or through the federal government and it links all the jobs databases that students can do. And then I, academics. I think that's a really solid point Holly, because it goes back to, again, taking pressure off because I'm like, think about like a 16, 17, 18 year old, like giving, like putting the pressure on them to like make a decision about what do you want to do for the rest of your life? Right. And, and I don't know the stats on this. You may have them, but how often kids change majors and careers just within their four year college um, years, if you will. I know I got to think back when, when I was going through undergrad, I think I changed majors four times mm -hmm. and I still ended up in a career that I didn't go to necessarily go to school for. I was just lucky that all of them had similar enough balance or, or they were all similar enough to where and taking enough credits during the college or during the summer years that I was able to still graduate in four years. I mean, obviously a lot of people are taking a lot longer. And then when that happens, then 
we start talking about, okay, what are the financial implications of that? Correct. Correct. Well, I think, you know, there's most colleges don't even require you to declare your major till second semester of your sophomore year. So it, it's really open ended. Um, you know, most college students change their major at some point. Absolutely. Um, it depends on the school. So, I don't, you know, I've, I've read stats anywhere from 30% to 60%. Some students, you know, if you're going to a school that specializes in engineering and you've been doing Lego cars and all that since you were little, you, you are more likely to stick because you've right. been engaged in that, right? Um, but, but it's really, you're also asking students, again, to seek like super far out, but then like, what are you really passionate about? And most 16 and 17 year olds, their passions are pretty normal, right? Video games, hanging out with friends, watching and TV. These are generally not things that that move us on into a career later on, but they could. So really taking that pressure off to say, you know what, you're going to go to a school and let's look at how a school will help you figure out what you want to be. So sit down and pull up the local school and look at programs for undecided majors. There's some really cool programs out there where colleges are helping students figure out who they want to be because they know they're going to change their mind. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned that because I think I have a couple kids in my own uh, family that believe that they're going to be YouTube sensation stars. And uh, that's where it's like going back to what you said, there's this fine line between <laughs> telling them the God's honest truth. Like that's probably not going to be in the cards for you. <laughs> right. Right. But you love to do this work. So how, how can you share your joy and your message and what you want to do? Like, what are other ways you can do that? Did you know that you could do this by being a corporate trainer? You could do this by being a motivational speaker. You could be a teacher. Like all of those things are kind of this. You don't have to be on YouTube to be an influencer. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. <laughs> um, so before we, we transition more so to focus on the, the student asp- aspect of this, is there anything that, that you'd want to clarify or button up on the parent side? Like what, maybe what parents should be, what, what have we missed on the parent side of the right. equation? I think there's three really important tasks a parent can do. And they're like, they tie into questions as well. So the first one is, understand your finances and what's available for college. All too often, I will have parents that will say, well, we'll just work it out. Well, what does work it out mean? If like, if college is going to cost you $60,000 a year, do you have $60,000 a year that you can pay? Well, no, then you can't work it out. So be very realistic, sit down and plan it out and be real with your student. This is how much money we have to you to give you for college. If you're not taking out loans as a parent, you upfront with your student that you're not going to take loans out as a parent, whatever it might be. So really, before you get into the meat of the let's look at colleges, have a really good idea of the finances. That is key. The other two things I think are great questions to ask because they help your student understand who they are and not in the heat of the moment. So when when your child experiences a failure and we all experience this failure, you're not going to answer this question. You're not going to ask this question, but after a little bit and they've stepped away, what's the one thing you've learned about this? What are you going to do differently? And do I, can I help you put a plan together to do something differently so that won't happen again? We learn the most from our failures, and sometimes we focus so much on the failure. And the goal is the failure doesn't define you. The misstep doesn't define you. It's your reaction to that. So as parents, we have to model that for our students. Their brains aren't there necessarily all there yet to be able to process it, but we can help them process it. It's a great skill that will last them the rest of their life. Conversely, a lot of times when our students succeed, we take the pictures, we give them all the kudos, and we walk away from it. The question is, what is your favorite thing about that success? Of everything that just happened, what is your biggest takeaway from it? And again, it's causing them to stop and think. And this pays off huge dividends as they start to look at colleges because they've already done some of that introspection that's so key in life not even only as a human, but as an employee, as a business owner, whatever it might be, those are really good skills to have. So just listening to you talk about that, as we transition to maybe more focus on the student side, but maybe a bridge to that is, can you walk us through or maybe emphasize how important having a college list is? 
Right. So you want to have you you want to definitely have a college list and you want to have a college list that makes sense. And it needs to match three things. It needs to be an academic fit, a social fit and a financial fit. And a lot of times we don't put all three pieces of those together. Um, you know, I once had a student tell me they wanted to be an engineer and three of the schools on their list didn't have an engineering program. It's like, okay, that could this, be a problem. that's a problem, right? Like that's, I, I want you, if, if engineering, if you decide to change your mind, we need to be, at least make sure schools all have engineering there you're, that you're looking at. Um, and social fit is different for everybody. Some people want a Greek system, some don't. Some students want a large school, some want a small school. So having a, a list, and then it also keeps you focused. One of the things that will start to happen as soon as a student takes a pre-ACT or pre-SAT, you check this box that says, yes, I want to be considered for scholarships. Well, that's how you get on college lists. So once you take those, those things, you are going to be inundated with college college is wanting to introduce themselves to you. If you're not focused on a list, it seems like it's never ending and it adds to the noise. So the list and sticking to it. Now there might be things that a list will change. Um, it's not something that's fixed in time. And that's another important thing. Like, right. You like wanting to go to Notre Dame since you were like nine. And I'm going to keep bringing that up. Cause that's a great example. <laughs> what happens if sophomore, you, you didn't want to go to Notre Dame anymore. It's really important as a parent to step away from that dream as well. Yeah. That, that would have been devastating for me right. personally. Right. But there are sometimes students like the, the school that they've dreamed about forever when they start the journey, they're like, I don't want to go there anymore. And sometimes it's a really hard thing for a family to come to terms with. Yeah. And I can see that because, and I, I've been through the situation personally with families I work with where say mom and dad both went to, we'll use equally Michigan or Michigan state. And the kids feel this intense pressure to go there. And, and, but really they, they don't. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's, it's really hard to buy into a place and to really engage in a community if you don't really want to be there. And the education at college is important. I am not, I mean, it's a higher education institution. It is not a higher social institution, but the things you do outside of the classroom in high school and in college are both very important. And so you want to make sure you connect with the community so you can get involved because that's where you're going to get your experience for the next phases of life. So let's transition into the, the student side of this equation. What, what should students, what are students missing in deciding how to approach this college selection process. I mean, obviously we just talked about developing the, the college list and why that's so important from an academic, social, and financial standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but from, from the student angle, Holly, what do they need to be doing? What do they need to be thinking about? Right. So first of all, step away from the rankings. And I guess that's kind of both parent and student. Um, and if you're going to use a ranking, like if you're going to use, you know, like US News and World Report or something like that, look to see how those rankings are devised. It's pretty interesting when you dig into it to be like, this is like pretty, like, this is not good information to base my choice on, right? But we get tied right. up in it. Um, so stepping away from those rankings, make sure you're involved in high school. And it doesn't mean over-involved. You need to have downtime because downtime is where reflection and rejuvenation happen. Downtime is when our brains can dream. Um, so find it what it is you like, especially in that first, that ninth grade year, try anything you might be interested in. Now you're not going to keep doing all those things as you move through high school. And then as you move through, it's okay to say goodbye to some things, try to increase your involvement in things that you really like. Um, looking at your academic course load. Um, does it make sense to take AP or honors classes if they're offered at your school? And how does that fit you as a student? Um, so, so those are the things a student can do. Um, don't get into, you know, my best friend's applying here. So this is where I want to apply or my significant other at the moment is applying to these schools. Look at the choices for where you are and be confident in what you're saying, right? Like there are, um, I look at you know, students pick, thing, pick their colleges for a variety of reasons and don't let somebody else's opinion sway you from that. For some reason, it's very hard for students in Michigan to look at schools in Ohio. I think it's because, you know, it's Ohio, right? Like it's just, yeah. I think Ohio state might have something to do with it. I'm not into it, but it is. But so if a student wants to go to school in Ohio and you really want to be at one of those schools, don't let your friends tell you like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you want to go to school in Ohio. There's a lot of great colleges in Ohio. 
You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because because of the diversity of families I work with and my own personal growing up and biases. I, before I started my firm, most people know this, I had a very good corporate career and I lived in five different states, moved 10 or 11 different times within like a 13 year period. And so I'm, I never got necessarily hung up on, to your point, like, well, we're staying in Michigan. I get that from quite a few families. I'm like, okay, so let's just say Ohio State comes knocking on the door and gives you a, I don't know, 50% scholarship or even better yet, gives you a full ride. Are you still not going to send your son or daughter there? Right. Right. It's interesting. Yeah. And I think that's another thing too, is students look, understand what the price tag is, right? So a lot of times people think if you go out of state, you're going to pay higher tuition. It's only going to be at some, some schools that are out of state public schools. Mm-hmm. It's a private school. It costs you the same to go to that school, whether you're in state or out of state. So really what is the true cost of attendance as we're looking at that financial fit piece? Um, and there's calculators online that can help you do that. And your school counselor can help you look at those things too. Um, so that's part of the piece as well. What does this really mean? And just because something says it's $60,000 to go to the school, look at what the average student is paying. You might find that it's cheaper than going to an in-state school. Yeah, I was just going to say that because that's where when it comes to the college planning that that I help families work on and, and do, um, that's a common misconception that, okay, private school is going to be too expensive. And in fact, you probably know this just as well as I do, Holly, sometimes, especially with kids with, with high enough academic standards, they will end up paying less at a private school than they do at a public school because- they can get more financial aid from that private school than they can that public school, say a Michigan or Michigan state. Absolutely. I see it all the time. Absolutely. So really sit down and look at what that means and just don't wave a school off because of the cost. Look to see what the end result. Now, an out-of-state public school, you're less likely to get scholarships to, right. um, especially if it's a school that's more selective. Um, just like you know, if you look at the sticker price of what a student will pay to go to Michigan or Michigan state if they live out-of-state, you, you would gasp, right? Um, yes. They want your out-of-state tuition dollars. Yeah. I don't know if, you, if you've if seen this, but I, over the last three or four years, I've seen a lot more interest in kids from Michigan because I work nationally, mm-hmm. but I'll see more interest from kids here in Michigan, the Midwest, if you will, wanting to travel down South to those SEC schools, whether it's Bama, Florida, Tennessee, yeah. um, And likewise, I will have families out east or even out west that will want to come to the Midwest. And, you know, a lot of people shake their head like, why would they ever want to do that? I think it's a I think it's a different differentiation of experience, not only from a geographic standpoint, um, climate. People know that each corner of, of the states is different. And they might want to open themselves up to being exposed to different political um, ideas, social ideas. It's very interesting. And it kind of just goes back to what criteria are you putting together when you're putting together your college list? Absolutely. And so it's really important to know who you are and ask those questions, right? Are you looking for a big school or a small school? And most students don't really totally no, because you, you're an expert in the high school you go to. And so that's, I always come back to where the student is the expert. Um, what have you liked about your high school? What don't you like? If I have a student that's like, oh my gosh, my favorite thing in the entire world is being able to have discussions in class. Well, this is a student that probably at a super huge school may not be as happy because those discussions may not happen till later, right? What are the activities you like? Um, you know, if I love to snowboard, well, well, then why are we looking at schools in, in, you know, Arizona where there's no, you know, or, or, you know, I guess there's Flagstaff, so you can get to the mountains, just get to Sedona, but you know, what are we, what are we like like, Alabama on that list? (laughs) Right, exactly. So let's look at what makes sense. And I think one of the things, you know, between our time and your, and and now going to college, the internet wasn't there, right? I wrote my name on a postcard with a social security number to get information from a college, right? Yes. Like that's what we did. Now there are so many search engines that the world has opened up. 
And so I'm able to see more of what's out there. And if you're thinking, you know what, I've lived in Michigan my entire life, or I've lived in Southern California my entire life, I want to see what's different out there. And I can experience that in college. The other thing, though, to think about with that is, is from the cost perspective, if I send my child to Alabama, or if I send my child to Tennessee, how easy is it for them to get home? And how does that add to the cost of my, my educational expenses? Yeah, I don't think a lot of parents would think about that. And that's part of my job as their advisor to bring that up. I'm like, okay, yeah, you know, Alice wants to go to, we keep using Bama, so let's just stick yeah. with it. <laughs> wants to go to Bama, which is great. Gets in, gets, you know, it, the cost is all, the, everything aligns up. But I'm like, do you realize how much a plane ticket back and forth is from Tuscaloosa? Right. Or like how many stops that she may have to make. And, right. you know, do you really feel comfortable having her drive, you know, 20 hours or you driving 20 hours, whatever it right. may be. So. And it starts to make changes as to what, um, what your family structure is then too. Student may not come home for Thanksgiving. Right. And there you are know, no one of my neighbors, weekends. it's funny to bring that up. One of my neighbors is a good friend of mine. His daughter is going to Arizona state. Um, and it's his second He's got four kids. So this is his, his second oldest. His oldest is actually at Michigan state. And one of the things that he mentioned to me is like, I'm not going to have that opportunity to go up to Michigan state. Like I do for his older daughter and, you know, have lunch or have dinner or right. slip, you know, $50 in her pocket or something like that, or do her laundry and just have conversations like right. one-on-one -on -one like that with his second oldest. That's going to be, you know, a plane ride away. Right. And he's like, I'm going to have a hard time with that. I'm like, right. I would too, but luckily we're neighbors and we'll still be at the bus stop next year together. Exactly. There you go. We'll be able to talk, talk through some of these things. Right. But it is, it is. So that's, that's an important piece to think about as well as you're looking at, at a college is how far is too far. Um, yes. And for every person that's different for every family, that's different. And again, honoring that, right? Like that's, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing, there, there's no wrong steps in this. There's no wrong college. Like even, I would say, even, even if you attend a school that you end up not liking, you can transfer. You can always transfer. How many of us as adults have left jobs that haven't been the right fit? Yeah. Or a new opportunity arises, right? What a great skill to teach a young person. Yep. You made this. And I always tell students, you are making the decision for the person you are today. You might be a different person later on and you might make some changes, but you don't beat yourself up for the decision. Like it's it, it, we, high school is a great time to have this, right? I wish I would have done this in ninth grade. Well, would your ninth, did your ninth grade self want to do that class? No. Okay. So then let your ninth grade self off the hook. There are many things I would have done in my youth that would have, that would be different. Right. So, so, right. so give, give your ninth grade self a break and, and thank her for the chances she took or he took and let's move on from it. Yeah. Those are, those are all excellent points. One thing I want to come back to that you brought yeah. up was how, how does a student and parent, I guess, go through the decision-making process of whether they start taking AP and honors courses in high school. Cause obviously, you know, with, with the AP classes, there's a, could be a fairly substantial financial component to that. Um, you know, I've had lots of kids, I say kids, you know, families yeah. that have had their kids start college at sophomore or mm -hmm. even like second semester sophomore levels, because they had all these AP credits. They took college classes during their high school years. And boy, does that make a big financial decision. Right. I've had kids get through, you know, we talk about, you know, kids taking more than four years to get to through college. I've had two or three, ex, you know, incredible examples of kids getting through in three, three and a half years. Right. Right. So I think, again, this is all listening to your student and listening and not, and, and not trying to buy into or get into the hype of what other students are taking. Right. Um, and some of it's going to depend on your school. Like at my school, we don't even have AP classes pretty much until the junior year. So that's not even a conversation we have. So it's really working closely with the school counselor as you're building the schedule. What makes sense? You know, don't take AP chem if you don't like chemistry. 
Um, if you love history, then let's look at doing some honors or AP classes there. You want to make sure that you're challenging yourself, but that you're also not over challenging yourself. If you're spending hours and hours a night studying, then maybe adding more AP and honors classes to your life isn't the right thing to do. Cause then it's that pressure. It's that pressure. That's the pressure. I think the tough thing is, you know, for some schools, you, you need to have the AP or honors classes to get into if your school offers them, not every high school offers them, but if your school offers them and you're looking at some of the more selective schools, they're going to want to see, they call it rigor, that you've been challenging yourself with rigor. For some students taking, you know, those classes makes absolute sense. For other students, they're challenging themselves just fine in the traditional curriculum. Um, so then it's building a college list that matches that and realizing where you go. There's a great book called Where You Go Is Not Who You Are. Um, and I love that book. Um, and you can have amazing, amazing opportunities in college that may not be a college that you see on a Saturday afternoon or in the, this student got into all these schools lists that you see at the end of every application cycle. Um, so it's really, it, it's, again, it's a very personal choice. If you're not doing any homework and you are pretty much coasting through high school, then you need to make sure you're taking AP and honors classes because you're not challenging yourself. And part of high school prep for college is how do you learn to study? How do you learn to time manage? Yeah, we we had one of my very first guests on the on the show was um, Sandy Hottie, who was a um, high school honors English teacher. And that was one of the things that was really frustrating her towards the end of her teaching career and why she decided to go into business on her own was that those study skills, those habits were not being taught, let alone developed in high school. And then when you get to college, it's a huge shock. I remember, I still remember when, when I was making that transition 20 some years ago, like I was almost straight a student in high school. When I got to college, I'm like, Oh, like, you know, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't, uh, uh, you know, Oz anymore. This is like really different. Like, and I didn't have the skills and it took me a couple of years to get grounded. But during those first couple of years, my, my GPA got destroyed. Right. And it wasn't until the back half of my career where I was able to start building that up because back then, like when you're applying to jobs and, and things like that, GPAs like really matter. Like they, you know, companies would ask, you know, well, what was your GPA? Right. So Absolutely. I, if you recall, before we started recording this, I'm like, we're going to have a really hard time to keep this under an hour. And I'm looking at my list of questions and I'm maybe like halfway through. <laughs> so we're definitely going to have to get you back on Holly, but I would the, love to come back. The, the one topic I want to get to um, before we, we get to my closing question is I would like you to walk our audience through what your business is um, that you also do. So you, <laughs> granted you're, you're full-time counselor, Mm -hmm. um, at, at mercy, but then you also work with families outside of that one-on-one -on -one through your, um, your business. So I'd like you to talk through that, what it is, how parents find you. Mm -hmm. And because as we are also talking, just like in my industry, in the financial service industry, there are a lot of bad actors. Mm -hmm. And so part of what I'm doing is always educating people on whether they work with me or not is, here are the things that you need to look for. These are things that an advisor should be providing for you. Mm -hmm. Just like here are the things that a guidance counselor or you know somebody that's helping you through this process, you should be looking for asking these questions. Absolutely. Um, so I work, um, I have my own business called Bennett's Consulting, and I work with three other individuals through our organization called Root, as in R-O-O-T, College Advising, and it's just rootcollegeadvising.com. Um, we're root because we want to be grounded and rooted in this process. So we were very intentional about the name we picked. Um, and it really depends on when a student comes to us. I have students that start working with us in ninth grade. And it's really having those conversations about course selection and activities and what are you going to do with your summer? You know, a summer spent playing video games is not necessarily the best summer. You don't need to be over-programmed, but what else are you doing? In the sophomore year, we start to talk more about test prep and we start to look at do some career work. Let's dive deeper into the academics you're taking. Where do we need to fine tune? Um, and in the junior year, we're working with students on building that college list. We're working on essays and 
SAT, ACT prep if a student chooses to test. Not everybody tests. Um, out of my own household, my own daughter is not testing. She's a senior. She has never taken a standardized test and doesn't plan to. We're supporting her in that decision, but it also means we're looking at colleges a little differently, um, right? So, but, so those are the things that we do on the outside. It's really... Um, as a supplement to what a school is doing. I will never go against what a school counselor is saying. They're the expert in their building, but we're there to help you one-on-one -on -one and minimize some of the stress and put that individual attention in that sometimes can't be done at high schools because the reality in Michigan is our counselors in many schools are overworked. Their caseloads are well above the national average, but they're there as a resource too. So we work alongside. Um, I will never promise an admission to a school. That is unethical. Um, and so it's really, let's find these best fits. And if you want to take some chances and apply to schools that are harder to get into, let's do that. But then let's also have that nice balance. So I would imagine just like me personally, and, and I've had families tell me this when, when I'm going through the discovery process with them. Like if I choose to work with you, Paul, you're going to work with my younger, my kids in another year or two, when they are able to mm -hmm. comprehend and start getting into this. And by all means, thus one of the terms I use family office and what that means, because they know that their kids won't listen to them about necessarily financial health and well-being or picking the right college. But if you have an outside person having those conversations, they can go a little bit further with it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I can have some great conversations with students. And a lot of times a parent will be like, I just told them, like, I know you did, but you know, as parents, we're not so bright. No, right? we're, we're, yeah. Right? Um, but, but outside of that, that, that's absolutely, you know, it's a very different story. So yeah, absolutely. So we're the people. And then to sometimes navigate some of those really tough conversations, because when a parent's feeling emotional and a student is feeling emotional, having that third party that can be in there, to just navigate some of that space is really important. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that because a lot of times with what I do as a financial advisor, I become that independent third-party arbitrator that can take some of that emotion and put down that fire a little bit more so than if you're just trying to do it on your own. So Absolutely. So rootcollegeadvising.com, we'll make sure that we link to that in the show notes. So we already know that we're going to have you back on, Holly. So awesome. let me let me get to my closing question that I, that I ask all my guests. And I know that you're a mom. You got you said you had a senior, and you've got two younger ones as well. So, what is the best thing about being a parent? Um, I think there's probably two things. One, how much they teach me about myself. Because as a parent, I, all three of my kiddos, I have seventh grade twins and a senior. Um, they are all extremely different. And so as a parent, I always have to think on my feet of how I'm going to interact with a situation or, or deal with a situation with one to the other, because it's all very different. And I think the very most awesome thing that I do as a parent, and I hope I do it sometimes well, sometimes not well, of course, you know, I'm human too, um, helping them figure out who they want to be. And, you know, we, we just talk about those kind of things very generally, like even with my seventh graders, it's like, oh my gosh, I noticed that you love math. I noticed that you really like English. I noticed that you can talk forever about my, my, I have two kids now that play hockey. My son will tell you about everything going on. He can watch a game and be like, that's where that got messed up. Like he can see a game of hockey, like nobody's business. Um, I, I, you know, I can see him potentially coaching in his future. That's going to be a part of who he is. Right. So we just talk about those kinds of things, but really helping find out where things are good and then helping them navigate those spaces that are challenging. I don't step in. Um, even in seventh grade, I will have them sometimes write an email to a teacher if they don't understand something, um, just because it teaches them that. So I think those are the things like helping them figure out who they are and watching those successes and then them teaching me every single moment of my life. It seems like. Yeah, that I love as, asking this question and the breadth of, of answers I get is, is tremendous. And, and I completely agree with you. So um, Holly, I cannot thank you enough for being on the show. Um, again, we'll link to, to your um, uh, root advising um rootcollegeadvising.com and our show notes and your LinkedIn. So people who have multiple avenues of, of how to reach out to you. And uh, we'll definitely look forward to having another conversation here soon. 
Great. Thanks so much, Paul. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. Please visit TamaCapital.com to subscribe to this podcast or to connect with certified financial planner and registered investment advisor, Paul Fenner of Tama Capital. And please join us again next time on the Emotional Balance Sheet Podcast. Mm-hmm.